Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome back to part two of my lecture on chapter five, climate and terrestrial biodiversity. So um, in the first part of, of this uh, lecture, part one uh, of chapter five, we uh, talked about weather, we talked about climate, um, and we talked a little bit about biodiversity. Now we're actually going to get into the uh, specific biomes uh, that we're going to have to uh, basically know and understand uh, for this course. Uh, so again, moving right along here, how does climate affect the nature and locations of biomes? So again, as we were saying in part one, uh, climate determines what plants and animals live in a certain area. So uh, biomes, what are they? They're large terrestrial regions. Again, terrestrial means uh, land, okay? We're going to do a, a whole chapter coming up, uh, chapter six, about uh, water or or aquatic biomes. So this is a chapter just on terrestrial, or again, biomes that are on land. Uh, each is characterized by a different type of climate and plant life, and they are not uniform, these biomes. So again, what is this showing here? Uh, this is showing Earth's major biomes. And again, uh, the average precipitation and the average temperature of a region determines the type of biome. So you'll notice we have our tropical rainforest near the equator where it is hot and wet. Um, we have a lot of our deserts near the 30 degrees north and south uh, latitudes because that's where we have sinking air. Uh, so it's dry usually. Um, you'll notice uh, the further north you go, you get into colder areas. So we get into an Arctic tundra type of biome. So again, these are basically natural capital or it's natural capital. Um, different precipitation and different temperature provide uh, the earth with different biomes, which then provide the earth with the abundance of biodiversity uh, that we see out there. So once again, uh, these are Earth's major biomes, uh, going from the high mountains to the deserts, again, tropical grasslands, the chaparral biome, uh, temperate rainforests, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, you can see uh, where all these biomes are located on the map of the Earth here. And again, now what we're going to do is we're going to go in and talk specifically uh, about each type of biome. So first, we're going to talk about deserts. There are three types of deserts you need to know uh, for this class. What is a desert? Uh, it's an area or a biome where the annual precipitation is low and that precipitation is scattered unevenly throughout the year. Now, deserts don't necessarily mean hot, okay, because we have something known as a cold desert. So for a desert, it's really about the precipitation, the rain or snow being very low and scattered unevenly throughout the year. Three types of deserts are tropical deserts, temperate deserts, and again, those cold deserts. Desert ecosystems are very vulnerable to disruption, especially human disruption. Why? Because they have slow plant growth and low species diversity. We're going to find out as we go through this course that the more biodiverse an area is, the better it can handle disruptions. So the less biodiverse an area is, the more vulnerable to uh, disruptions uh, it is. That's why in desert ecosystem, you don't have a lot of plants. You don't have a lot of uh, species of, of animals or plants there. Not a, lot of, not a lot of diversity. So desert ecosystems are vulnerable to disruption. Also, very slow nutrient cycling in a desert, again, makes it vulnerable to uh, that, uh, disruption. All right. So... What we're looking at here are something called climographs. You may have done these uh, back in earth science a couple of years ago. Um, what we're looking at here is in blue is the amount of precipitation in millimeters, and the red line is the mo mean monthly temperature in Celsius. So you're going to need to have a general understanding of these biomes and the climographs that go along with the biome. So first type of desert is a tropical desert. You'll notice very low precipitation scattered unevenly, and and in a tropical desert, you have a rather high temperature year round. Temperate desert, this would be something similar to maybe the, uh, uh, the southwest of the United States, Arizona, for instance. You'll notice temperate desert, again, not a lot of precipitation, very low. Temperature, a little cooler than the uh, tropical desert, obviously, uh, as the temperate desert being more in the uh, temperate or more in the mid-latitudes, you know, kind of cold in the winter months, a little bit warmer uh, in the summer months. Uh, your cold desert, this occurs up in the north, okay, near the, uh, near, near the poles. And again, you'll notice not a lot of precipitation, very low precip. Um, for a cold desert, obviously, in the winter months, it is cold. Temperature averages below zero, uh, and then it warms up again 
in the summer months. So key to deserts, it's not necessarily about the temperature because again, we have these cold, temperate and tropical deserts. It's really about the precipitation. Uh, in a desert, you don't get a lot of rain or snow. Science Focus 5.1 talks about staying alive in the desert, desert uh, survival adaptations. Obviously, plant water conservation is very important. As again, looking at those climographs, uh, we're not seeing much in the way of precip, either rain or snow in these deserts. So yet plants need to conserve water. How do they do that? By going dormant, by having deep roots that go down really well far into the ground to try to find that water. Uh, storing water in leaves. Uh, they have waxy leaves. A lot of the plants uh, in deserts and those leaves help reduce water loss. And a lot of plants in the desert only open up the pores at night where you have less of a chance of evaporation. These are the pores and the leaves, less of a chance of evaporation um, of the plant's moisture. Uh, how do desert animals adapt? Well, they hide in cool burrows or rocky crevices by day. They, again, are dormant, um, especially during the day. Camels drink massive amounts of water and store that water right in those humps. Uh, and reptiles' thick outer coverings minimize their water loss as well. So, again, just some of the uh, evolutionary adaptions uh, that, ha that uh, organisms living in a desert have had to go through. All right, so that's deserts, your three types. Next type of biome we're going to talk about are grasslands. And once again, there are three types of grasslands. So grasslands exist in the interior interior of continents, areas that are a little too moist for deserts, but too dry to be forests. So grasslands are kind of in the middle of your desert and your forest. Uh, to have a forest, you need a lot of water to be able to support big trees, right? Desert, very little water. So grasslands are kind of in the middle. A grasslands will have more water than a desert, but less water than a forest. Therefore, they're going to have more uh, plant life than a desert, but less plant life than you would find in a forest. So three main types of grass grasslands, tropical grasslands, temperate grasslands, and the cold grasslands, which we call the Arctic tundra. So here are your three types of grasslands. Again, looking at the climograph, here's your tropical grasslands. These are the savannas, otherwise known as. Um, this is what you would see uh, in the plains of Africa, right? So again, you'll notice the precip, uh, not a lot during the summer months, but during the winter, they do get a decent amount of rain uh, or snow. So in this case, mainly rain, obviously, with temperatures well above freezing. But as we go into the uh, colder grass, lands, there could be some snow there. Again, precipitation, rain and snow together. So more than a desert. Uh, and you'll notice temperatures in a tropical grassland are kind of the same throughout the year, basically hot uh, year round. Your temperate grasslands are just that temperate. So similar to here in Ardsley, uh, in the winter, it's going to be cold. And in the summer, it's going to be warm. And once again, you're going to get more precipitation than you would in a desert, but not as much as we're going to see when we get to the forest biomes uh, in just a bit. Final type of grassland, the cold grassland, otherwise known as the Arctic tundra. Again, not a lot of moisture, but a little more moisture than the cold deserts. Uh, and again, it's cold in the winter, warmer in the summer, what you would expect up in the Arctic regions. All right, so those are grasslands. Again, our three types. Uh, we'll talk about them a little more here in words. So again, tropical grasslands, otherwise known as savannas, warm temperatures year round, uh, and you have a lot of grazing and browsing animals like zebras. Uh, temperate grasslands, cold winters, hot, dry summers. This would be Kansas, right? Uh, these are your tall grass prairies and your short grass prairies. Often the temperate grasslands have been converted to farmland, and uh, this is a, a biodiversity killer because what you're seeing here is grassland that has been uh, degraded by cultivating one type of crop. So here, all we have growing is wheat, um, and this is a biodiversity killer, right? Because you don't have any biodiversity. You have one type of plant all over here, and it's just wheat, all right? And you took a, a, a tropical grassland, which had a lot of different plants and animal species, a lot of biodiversity, and unfortunately uh, turned it into uh, a crop that with one crop. So when we talk about food production in a couple of chapters, uh, we'll talk a, a little bit more about this. Arctic tundra, again, uh, that's your cold grassland. Uh, plants uh, live uh, close to the ground to conserve heat. Most grow in a short summer. Animals have thick fur. And you have something called permafrost up there, which is the underground soil that stays frozen year round. Uh, alpine tundra is basically above the tree line in mountains. So believe it or not, um, when you can 
actually be at lower latitudes and be above the tree line on the top of mountains. And that's actually an alpine tundra, uh, similar to an Arctic tundra, but it's not in the Arctic. It's on the top of mountains. So for instance, Mount Marcy up in uh, the Adirondacks, if you actually top to the uh, hike to the top of Mount Marcy, which is the highest point here in New York State, uh, the last 500 to 1,000 feet is actually alpine tundra uh, up there because it's, uh, it's above the... Uh, tree line. All right, my favorite biome, the chaparral biome. What is a chaparral biome? All right, so we talked about deserts, we've talked about grasslands, now is the chaparral. Uh, chaparral is a dry, temperate biome. This is California, guys. If you've ever been out there, California has the chaparral uh, biome. Uh, it occurs in coastal regions that border deserts, dense growths of low growing evergreen shrubs. You have some small trees with leathery leaves. You have very thin soil and uh, it's adapted to and maintained by occasional fires, believe it or not, that chaparral. Again, going to be dry uh, and going to be temperate. Here is a picture uh, of your chaparral biome. Again, this is what you see uh, out in the western parts of the U.S., uh, California especially. All right, forests now. There are three types of forests. What are are forests. They are lands dominated by trees. You're going to have tropical forest, you're going to have temperate forest, and you're going to have cold forest, uh, also known as the northern coniferous. Uh, coniferous and the boreal forest. All right, we'll get into them right now. First is your tropical rainforest. So what are you noticing on the climograph? A lot of rain, right? So now we're talking about forests, which will have more moisture than the grasslands have, and that's why they're able, able to support bigger trees, right? So tropical rainforest, tropical, hot year-round, lots of rain. Your temperate deciduous forest, that, this is Ardsley, all right? We live in a temperate deciduous forest. Again, we have a decent amount of rain here uh, or snow, and it's cold in the winter, it's warm in the summer. That's your temperate deciduous forest. And now as we head further north, you have the northern coniferous forest, otherwise known as the boreal or the taiga. These are your pine tree forests, right? And what you'll notice, all right, more rain than the grasslands, cold in the winter, kind of warmer in the summers, all right? That's what you're getting uh, in the northern uh, coniferous forest. Uh, so again, words, tropical rainforest, right? Hot, high moisture in the air down there. Uh, stratification of specialized plant and animal niches. We'll take a look at a picture about that in just a second. Rapid recycling of scarce soil nutrients. That's something that the uh, AP likes to point out. The soil in tropical rainforest is horrible. All the nutrients in a tropical rainforest are actually in the trees, in the canopy of the, of the trees and the plants. It's actually not in the soil nutrients. So uh, in a tropical rainforest, you have scarce soil nutrients. Uh, what is the impact of human activities in the rainforest? Obviously, uh, we're cutting down a lot of trees uh, to make... Uh, farmland, um, and that's killing biodiversity. So this is what we're talking about, our stratified niches in a tropical rainforest. And this is why tropical rainforests are the most diverse uh, uh, places on planet Earth when it comes to biodiversity, because in one a column here in the rainforest, you have all these different creatures living because they all live at different levels of the rainforest, occupy that niche there. And so you can support so much biodiversity, so many different plants and animals in a tropical rainforest, because again, they can not only live on the surface, but they can occupy these special niches uh, as you go up up, up the uh, canopy. So again, the black crowed Antipita kind of lives on the bottom and feeds on the bottom of the forest, while the harpy eagle lives at the top of the trees and feeds up there. Uh, the toucan kind of feeds in the middle with the woody, woolly opossum who kind of lives in the middle of these trees, right? The, uh, the uh, tapir roams the bottom of, of the tropical rainforest. So again, uh, you have these stratified niches which allow for a lot of biodiversity uh, in our tropical rainforest. The temperate deciduous forest, again, that's Ardsley, uh, cooler temperatures, abundant moisture. You have your broadleaf deciduous trees. What are deciduous trees? Those are trees that lose their leaves in the fall, right? Coniferous trees are pine needles, pine trees, they don't lose their leaves. Deciduous trees lose their leaves in the fall. Slow rate of decomposition. And what is the impact of human activities on temperate forests? Again, cutting down these forests for wood, uh, things like that. Homes, obviously, are destroying the biodiversity. And here is a picture um, of a, uh, I believe this is a temperate rainforest, all right? So uh, rainforest kind of in the temperate area 
meaning a lot of rain, but temperatures colder in the winter, warmer uh, in the summer. That's what temperate means. Then you have your coastal coniferous forest, again, also called temperate rainforest, like we just looked at, uh, found in scattered coastal regions, ample rainfall and moisture from fog. Uh, and you have your evergreen coniferous trees there. And again, then the cold northern coniferous forest, also called the boreal or the taigas. Uh, this is south of the Arctic tundra, where you're going to have cold winters and short summers. Uh, and a lot of, again, a lot of those pine trees, those, those evergreen trees. Okay, mountains play an important ecological role. This is another type of biome we'll look at. What are mountains? Steep or high elevation lands. A large portion of the world's forests are actually in mountain biomes. Uh, they're islands of biodiversity because when you get high in the mountains, uh, a lot of those creatures can't mingle with other creatures lower in the valleys. And so they're actually like islands uh, uh, in, in these high mountain regions, uh, habitats for endemic species. They help regulate Earth's climate, these mountain areas, and they're also major storehouses of water, right? Uh, they have a large role in the hydrologic cycle mountain. So what are we looking at here? Beautiful picture uh, of a mountain valley somewhere. Um, and again, you'll notice the, the water, the river, um, snowpack, uh, things like that occurring uh, in these mountains. So critical concepts, your evaluation of natural capital. We're almost done now, all right? We've gone through the biome. So uh, the... Um, this little critical concept talks about this guy, Robert Costanza, and his colleagues. They estimate the economic value of ecosystem services by the Earth's forest to be over $15 trillion per year, far greater than the value of money uh, that cutting down the forest for timber would bring. Uh, underpricing of the national resources when not considering the services they provide lead to unsustainable management. What is this? This is that full cost pricing we've been talking about uh, so far throughout the course. Uh, again, uh, uh, the, the value of the forest, eco, eco, uh, the ecosystem services it provides to planet Earth far outweigh the money that the lumber brings in. So if we would charge for that, the lumber, making the lumber so much more expensive, uh, people would find uh, other ways to build homes and not necessarily use wood. Other important ecosystem services include pollination, clean water, seed dispersal, uh, soil fertility, decomposition of organic waste, pest control, flood control, climate regulation, and cycling of nutrients. So again, this just kind of, in this case study, uh, talks about the value of the natural capital in each of these biomes, forest biome over 15 trillion trillion, grasslands, 12 trillion, uh, et cetera. You'll notice the aquatic uh, natural capital. Again, we're going to get into aquatic biomes uh, in the next chapter. But again, just an idea of how much uh, these biomes are worth without touching them, right? Just worth with the natural capital uh, that they provide for planet Earth. All right, final two slides. Humans have disturbed much of Earth's land. About 60% of the world's major terrestrial ecosystems have been degraded or used unsustainably. Uh, the human ecological footprint, we've talked about this, is spreading throughout the globe. So last slide here. Uh, this is just natural capital degradation. My advice, understand uh, these charts. Again, these charts are really nice in the the book. Uh, they lay it out really nice here. These are major human impacts on terrestrial ecosystems. So I definitely would know a few of these for each of the ecosystems, each of the biomes, just in case you have to uh, pull it out for an FRQ, right? So deserts, uh, large desert cities is a big major impact. Destruction of soil and underground habitat by off-road vehicles, depletion of groundwater, land disturbance for mineral extraction. In the grasslands, we're converting to cropland, releasing a lot of carbon dioxide by burning the grassland, overgrazing of livestock, uh, and we also have oil production and off-road vehicles in the Arctic tundra, which is causing problems. Forests, clearing for agriculture, livestock, timber, etc. Conversion of diverse forests to tree plantations. When you plant one tree, right, that is a biodiversity killer. Off-road vehicles damage forests uh, and pollution from streams. Then in the mountains, agriculture, timber, and mineral extraction hydroelectric dams, reservoirs, air pollution, and soil damage from off-road vehicles are other ways that humans are impacting the mountainous biomes. All right, guys, that concludes my lecture on Chapter 5, Climate and Terrestrial Biodiversity. And as always, I thank you for listening.